uh, Vancouver Island Brewery. I'm Brady. I'll be your uh, tour guide. A little bit too short for our bar since we renovated it, so everybody right around here, it's going to be hard to get eye contact with you. Don't feel offended, please. So, Don came in. He said that you guys were a group of uh, agrologists. I thought he said urologists. That's not as immediately my mind starts really and I'm like, okay, what kind of questions are a group of urologists going to ask in the book of the process? And I asked him again, he said, you're an agrologist. And then I said, oh shit. <laughs> I am going to admit this right away. The agricultural portion of brewing, probably the thing I know the least about. <laughs> so you guys can ask me as many questions as you'd like. But be patient while I search Google on my phone. <laughs> Other than that, I'm going to try and do my best to uh, show you guys the whole process from beginning to end. Uh, raw ingredients to finished product. That beer that you guys all enjoy, hopefully. Uh, and we'll hopefully have fun. So the way the tour is going to work, I am going to start out with talking about the history of you know, brewing in Vancouver Island in general a little bit. Get all that stuff out of the way right away. Uh, then I'm going to talk about my beers. Uh, each of you guys get four samples with the tour. I know it's early, <laughs> but I'm sure I can convince you guys to uh, drink a few samples of beer. There are a ton of you. I have seven beers on tap. I'm going to pick my four favorite because it's going to be pretty insane if it's a free-for-all. Everybody asking uh, to have the beers that they want. So hopefully I'll make good choices. I uh, will have a couple samples right off the bat. After I'm done talking about the history, I'll talk about the beer a little bit. Then we'll go up into the brew house, if we can all fit up there. And I'll get started. I'll talk about the whole process from beginning to end. And then we'll come back down after I've talked your ears off, have a few more samples, and hopefully be friends by then. <laughs> That's the idea. First thing first, history. Uh, Vancouver Island in general, or Victoria in general, always had a very rich craft beer history. Uh, if you think about it, in the 1800s, there was a railway. Uh, went across Canada. People in Vancouver could get beer from Toronto, people in Toronto could get beer from Vancouver. But quite often the beer didn't make that trip across the water to the island. So if the beer doesn't come to you, you brew the beer for yourself. So you're not going to go beerless. So there were a ton of craft breweries in the late 1800s, early uh, 1900s in Victoria, between 10 and 15. And uh, Prohibition hit. So, prohibition hits and you're a small independent company that makes alcohol, one of two things happens. You either go out of business or you get bought up by the big companies. So, that whole process of going out of business or being bought up went on for a few decades and by the mid-50s, there was one brewery left in Victoria after having between 10 and 15. And it was owned by Labatt. <laughs> And they brewed there for a few decades, and then in 1982 they said, hey, let's cut costs, let's consolidate all of our brewing to the mainland. They closed down the brewery here, and actually tore down half the building. So we were left with no beer being made on the island. That only lasted for two years, people couldn't stand it. So a group of locals got together, they bought a farmhouse out in central Saanich, which is that direction for those of you who aren't from here, uh, and started brewing craft beer. That was the original Vancouver Island Brewery. Uh, craft beer is a term that's thrown around a lot these days. You hear it all over the place. You see craft beer sections in the liquor stores. Does anybody here really know what it means? Chris? Yeah. <laughs> uh, if, if you look it up in the dictionary, it comes down to production, how much you make per year. But being a small, you know, locally owned independent company, there's more than just numbers. It's about a mentality. So the first thing that we wanted to do was make sure that we're making the best beer possible. So get the best ingredients, the freshest ingredients that we could. So we get all of our malts from the Canadian prairies. Uh, we get our hops from uh, Washington and Oregon, the Yakima Valley. And we use local water because Victoria water has some good mineral content for growing a wide variety of different styles of beer. So that's one thing, ingredients. We want to have the best ingredients possible. Another thing, obviously, is passion. We brew beer because we like beer. It's not the most lucrative industry in the world. I don't get paid big bucks to stand here and talk about beer all day. 
I do it because I like to stand here and talk about beer all day. So that's another big part of it. It's not about the bottom line to us. If you ask 99% of the people in this brewery, they wouldn't know how much we put out per year. I don't know, they don't tell me those numbers, so I can't tell you guys, I suppose, but I don't know, most people don't know. Only the big managers do. So it's all about you know, the passion, enjoying what we do, right? And finally, the probably the most overlooked aspect of craft beer, in my opinion anyways, is education. So in North America especially, we're kind of raised to think that there's one type of beer out there. It's that pale North American lager, you know, that kokanee, that Budweiser, that, that style of beer. And don't get me wrong, there is definitely a time and place for that style of beer when it's brewed right. But if you break down what goes into beer, you've got four ingredients. You've got hops, you've got malt, you have water, and you have yeast. There are about two dozen or so malt varieties that we use in the brewery. There are about 115, 120 hop varieties, and that's constantly growing. You guys would know all about that. Uh, there's thousands and thousands of different yeast strains and everywhere's water is unique. So to be raised to think that there's only one type of beer is insane. There are near infinite combinations of these four ingredients that you can make to create all different styles and all different flavors. Like I said, I've got seven beers on tap. They are all distinctly different from each other. So craft beer is kind of about showing people what beer can be as opposed to what we think beer is already. There's the more you delve into it, it gets crazy. You get sour beers, you get barrel aged and wine barrels or bourbon barrels. It's nuts. Beer's cool. <laughs> <laughs> so it was kind of those ideas that were in our head when we started the brewery. I'm not in my head, I wasn't born yet, but in the head of the people who started the brewery. And it's that mentality that we've tried to carry on for the last thirty years. And I think we've done a pretty decent job personally. But again, ultimately it's up to you guys to tell me if the beer is good. So, now the history's out of the way. Let's try a couple beers. Everybody cool with that? Yeah. <laughs> could, could I ask just where the central Saanich location was that you talked about? I the don't know the exact address. Okay. I wish Barry was in here. He's our owner. Actually, our, our owner is still the same guy it was in 1984. Like it's such a family atmosphere here, it's so cool. He comes in, he throws his arm around my shoulder, asks me you know, if I have a girlfriend, how I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> so, sorry, is this company that company? Is it the same one that was yeah. started? Oh, same, I see. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Oh, okay. It was originally okay. called uh, Island Pacific Brewing, yeah. and now it's oh, okay. Vancouver Island Brewery. Oh. Yeah. Same, there's uh, Ruth Hall is one of our office ladies. She's been here since 1986. Oh. She's the nicest person in the world. She's the kind of person that you want to hire as your grandma, even if you have to call <laughs> She's just the best. <laughs> and most people are like that here, it's awesome. What do I want for you guys? Uh, I think that we should do High Trail, the Honey Ale. That's a good morning beer. <laughs> Cheers, thanks John. Uh, sea Dog because it's my favorite after work beer. It's my favorite uh, if I work a hard day, so not after today. I just talk about beer today, but if I work on the bottling line, I go home, I'm drinking a Sea Dog, so I'm going to pour that one. Uh, I'll pour our Blackberry Saison because it's fun to say and it sounds interesting. <laughs> yeah, it's good tasting. Uh, and I got to pour Herminator. Herminator is our seasonal beer that just got released and it's Something special. It's recognized worldwide as one of the best of its uh, style. I'm going to start with High Trail and Black Lady though, I think. But it's, uh, it's a nice light beer. If you're in the, uh, involved in beer culture at all, you'll notice a lot of uh, potentially pretentious words being thrown around. Like any you know, drink industry, 
Everybody likes to find those tasty notes, like pencil shavings and shoe leather. <laughs> <laughs> Never have an eaten shoe leather. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. I've read soft reviews that say pencil shavings and shoe leather. It's the same. Yeah. <laughs> Turpentine. No way. Turpentine. I know. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. This guy, he tastes funny. <laughs> it's got a nice subtle honey flavor though. I personally have a little bit of a beef with some honey beers in that they get really sweet. Like almost cloyingly sweet. Ours is a little bit more dry, which is why I like it. It's, uh, you know, throw one of those words out. It's very approachable. It's, <laughs> you have some of this beer and you have a huge beer drinking. They can usually wrap their minds around it. It's, it's not too hard to drink. It's not too hard to, uh, to yeah, enjoy. It's I quite like it. It's called High Trail. It's one of those beers that you can take on a hike and open at the end. It gives the illusion of rehydration. <laughs> one of those. What do you guys think? General consensus. Good beer? Good. 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 Yeah. Cheers. For sure. Who's my ego? The best honey beer I've had. Oh, well. Of course. I like it. There's a lot more honey lager, so why don't you guys do a honey ale? Do you know the difference between lagers and ales? Top and bottom fermenting yeast. It is essentially two different types of yeast. Skipping ahead, usually I talk about this way later. Two or this is a good time. Um, it's, it all comes down to the different yeast that you use. So those two yeasts ferment a little bit differently. Uh, lager yeast ferments at colder temperature, uh, predominantly at the bottom of the tank, and they take a little bit longer. Ales, warmer temperature, top of the tank. Uh, shorter process. That is more or less trivial. I'm not going to quiz you guys on that. But the way it affects your end, uh, your end products is in the body of your beer. So it really comes down to the way you want your beer to feel, like the mouthfeel of it. Uh, the easiest way for me to describe it would be taking like a Guinness. Everybody's had a Guinness before, or any stout really. Uh, and I, our bourbon start product, if anybody's from here from Victoria, you probably had it. You take a sip of Guinness, uh, you get lots of roasty, espresso, chocolatey flavors in there. Uh, immediately, you realize the density of the beer. It's got a very thick, heavy body. And it clings to the, it's very viscous, it clings to the inside of your mouth. You swallow it, you feel it go down, and you feel it sit in your stomach, and it stays with you. <laughs> Herbs, you take a sip of it. Very similar flavor profile. You get those roasty flavors, you get those espresso flavors. But the body is much thinner right off the bat. It's, it's not as thick, it's not as cloying or viscous. And when you swallow it, it finishes very dry and it pretty much disappears. It doesn't linger, it doesn't stay with you. Uh, so I guess, case in point, uh, lagers tend to have a lighter body. Uh, they're a little bit higher in carbonation and a little bit drier usually. Ales are a bit more meaty. They're something you can chew on before you swallow it. And Depending on when you add your honey during a beer, it uh, will affect the way your beer tastes. If you add it at the end, your beer is going to thicken a little bit. And a lot of those lagers will add honey at the end, and it will thicken the mouthfeel up a little bit. That's why it's you know, that cloying sweetness, right? We add our honey at a specific point in the brewing process that dries out the honey flavor quite a bit and doesn't add that body. So we use that ale yeast to give it a little bit more body without needing that honey. Answer the question? Yeah. <laughs> Anybody done? Are we ready for another sample? Last day? <laughs> Come on, bring it up. <laughs> I'll step forward. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you can have one. <laughs> yeah, I can use this to be fancy. Yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> It's a question I like to ask because it lets me know the amount of leeway I have. Sometimes I'll get two people in on a tour that have never done anything with their wine drinkers. They have no idea about beer. And I say, okay, we get in this vat and we stomp on the wine grapes or the, the beer grapes. <laughs> so if you guys are very savvy, then I have to tell the truth all the time. <laughs>
Uh, downstairs, I mentioned the four ingredients of beer. You've got your water, you've got your malts, you've got your hops, you've got your yeast. It's our job as a brewery to do two things with those ingredients. A, combine them to make beer, so give them alcohol, and B, make them taste good, so that you guys will drink them. The first step to that happens in here. This is called our mash time. This is where we add the first two ingredients, our waters and our malts. And what we do is we mix them up and heat them up to a very specific temperature, which is about 64 degrees Celsius. And what that does is it kickstarts enzymes. And those enzymes break down the starches in the malts into sugars. Those sugars will either be fermentable and give us alcohol, or be non-fermentable and give us sweet flavors to our beers. And the enzymes will also break down proteins, which will give us a bit of body and a bit of flavor to our beer as well. Uh, once we're done our mash, once we've got our sugars and our proteins are broken down, the next step is to separate the liquids from the solids. Because at this point, if you open it up when they're brewing, it looks like a really watery porridge mixture. And it probably tastes very similar. So we have to get those malts out, get that grain out. And that happens in the water time here. There's some pipes and tubing underneath the uh, floor here. And we transfer everything into the next tank. Uh, this guy is really cool. So if you guys want to do that single file drive by here, it's pretty fun to look inside. It looks like a gigantic piece of farming equipment. who are getting to it. Uh, like I said, it looks like a giant piece of farming equipment. There's big rakes in there. Those rakes spin around to keep everything from clumping up. Uh, and at the bottom of the tank, you'll notice a grate. So that grate is called a false bottom. And underneath that is the actual bottom of the tank. And it's a very, very basic filter that Germans have been using for centuries. And the way it works is you put your mash in here, that water and mulch, you mix it all up, you get those rakes going. And the grate holds up the grain, the liquid filters down to the bottom, and we sparge the mass with hot water so that the water goes right from the very top down and picks up any remnant sugars or proteins that we may have missed in that first go around. Once we're done filtering everything out, we're left with two things. Our spent grain. Now, what do we do with that? We actually store it in a silo out back and get the local farmers. Because it makes for very uh, nutritious cattle feed or pig feed. Uh, still has lots of nutrients, good with proteins. Uh, and they seem to really like it. <laughs> so it goes to, uh, goes to them. There's tons of different uses for it. Some people make bread, uh, dog treats. The product of the cattle, which is very good when you send it to raise them. I will attest to that. So uh, that's where we uh, send it. And at the bottom of the tank, we have our wort. So wort is the name for beer before it's been fermented, or the yeah, yeast to it. If we wanted to, at this point, we could put yeast in there and ferment it. You would get alcohol, because all you need is sugar and yeast. But your end product would taste very bad. Uh, basically, right now, it's just sugar water. So you would be fermenting sugar water. Your, your end product would taste very sweet, like just putrid yeast. Not very good at all. So we have to balance it out. When you talk about balance in beer, you talk about the sweetness of malts that you have versus the bitterness of hops. And that's what we need to add. That's our next step. So we transfer the liquid for our wort into this guy. It's called our boil kettle. And it's where we add the hops. So we bring it up to a boil and we literally just open that door and dump buckets of hops in. But we add them at very specific times. Because depending on when you add your hops, determines what the hop will make the beer. So early on in the brew, or early on in the boil, we'll do our first hop addition, we call it. Uh, those hops are going to be in there a lot longer. And what ends up happening is you boil off a lot of the aroma and flavor, which comes from the oils, and you extract acid from the hops. And that acid gets your, your bitterness. So the early hop addition will give you that very distinct bitterness that you get from pale ales or IPAs. 
later on, you can boil black hops again. Those hops aren't going to be in there as long, and you're not going to have enough time to get that acid out, and you're not going to boil off the oils. So those oils are going to give you the aroma and flavors that you get from a very well hopped beer. So uh, the piney aromas, floral aromas, citrus aromas, like I said, there's over 100 different varieties, and they all taste different. Uh, I know in New Zealand they actually you know, crossbred all these different strains and designed a hop to taste like Sauvignon Blanc. No. That's not <laughs> it. No joke. <laughs> so, no, it's interesting. I've actually had an IPA made with it and it's really good. Like, there's a uh, Elysian in a brewery down in Seattle. They make uh, an IPA called so the Savant IPA. It's called Sauvignon Blanc. It's really good. You ever see it in the store? Pick it up. It's tasty. But yeah, there's. All those flavors come from the late hop additions. That's very similar to steeping tea. If you oversteep your tea, your tea becomes bitter. You steep it right, you get all those aromas and flavors that you want, right? So it all comes down to how long it's in the boil. Once we're finished adding all our hops, once we're done our boil, our cooking process is more or less done. It's time to add yeast and get the fermentation going. But we still have a boiling pot liquid. If you add yeast to a boiling hot liquid, the yeast is going to die. Yeast is a living microorganism as part of the fungus family, and we need it to be very alive to actually ferment anything. So we have to cool this down. And the way we cool it down is with that guy, the wort cooler. There's a lot of you, so I'm not going to bother moseying all the way back over there. But uh, basically it's like a radiator. So it's made up of a series of plates. There's two different types of plates in there. There's water plates and there's wort plates. And they're arranged in such a way that in one direction we pump cold water through the water plates, the other direction we pump hot water through the water plates, and they pretty much exchange temperature. So the cold water cools down the wort, the hot wort heats up the water to the point that we're actually ready to start our next mash. So we pump that water that we use straight into our hot water tank, and the wort gets cooled down enough for us to pitch yeast into it. It actually goes from over 100 degrees Celsius to below 20 degrees Celsius in about an hour. All the liquid in one of these tanks. So it's very space efficient, time efficient, and energy efficient. It's a really cool process. It's another part of craft burning. You want to do your part energy wise. So this guy's another way that we do it. It's our, uh, it's our condenser. So we try to collect as much water as we can from our boil by condensing the steam, cycling it back into our system. It's all fun stuff. And now our wort is cooled down enough for us to start the fermentation process. Picture our yeast. Let the, the magic happen. And that happens down the hallway. Can I just ask how long it's taken, this process? This process it appears about six to nine hours, with yeah. the actual time in the tanks and then the time transferring. Oh, okay. yeah. This is the first hour of the magic of the tank will take into the fermentation. Uh, yeah. yeah. It's about six to nine hours. It's so hard. It's one of the what our Or Where do you get your water from? The watershed. Local watershed. And you don't, I presume you don't use chlorinated city water. We filter it all out. We filter our, uh, our water very heavily. And so you, you take city water and then filter all the and remove all the uh, treatment, yeah. All right. Nice and cozy in here. <laughs> so, behind me is our cellar. So that's where our fermentation tanks are. That's where we actually turn the wort into beer. This is normally where I bring up lagers and ales, but we've already covered that. So you guys know that it's two different types of yeast, and basically here, it means that our first job is to set that temperature, because the lager needs a colder temperature, ale needs a warmer temperature. So we get our wort in these tanks, we set the temperature, and we pitch our yeast. First thing the yeast does is reproduce. So if you see those pictures of those big beer vats with all the foam on top, that's that yeast colony growing. And the colony is going to grow about four to six times in size right off the bat before any fermentation happens. Mm. Once it's done all that reproduction, it starts eating up those sugars that we got from the malt. And what it does, it breaks those sugars down into carbon dioxide and alcohol. That process goes on for about one week as a general benchmark. After that week is up, we have beer. 
we have that 5%, 6%, 7%. Uh, Herminator will pour you guys later is 9.5%. What we do is uh, in the boil kettle yeah. at the very end of the boil, yeah. we do a whirlpool. Mm -hmm. So that whirlpool gets everything to clump up in the uh, in the center, and we've got the exit of the tank is out towards the side. So there, you know, there'll still be some hops in there, mm -hmm. but it's not going to affect the fermentation. It's not going to be super chunky. We use uh, pelletized hops, so it's, they're condensed. Yeah. So it's much less messy than if you're using the whole cone hops. You don't need to put in quite as much. So once we're done that fermentation, once we have our beer, it's not quite done yet. There's still a couple more steps. First, we have to get the yeast out. So we cool the temperature right down. The yeast literally is like deactivates and it sinks down to the bottom of the tank. Uh, we evacuate it. We actually save some because much like a sourdough yeast, you can reuse your brewer's yeast for multiple batches. Uh, because, like I said, it reproduces. So what we do is we try to save that new generation. It ferments, it reproduces, save that new generation. So you keep using the next generation. Uh, we use our yeast for about 13 batches. Mm -hmm. uh, some breweries use it up to 30 batches. I know I was talking to a brewmaster of a really small brewery in Ontario, and he said they use it until it tastes weird. <laughs> <laughs> What type of <laughs> like in the health food store? Yeah, that's kind of stuff. I don't know if it's post or pre, <laughs> but uh, it's basically that strain of yeast because there's so many different types of yeast that that type of yeast is brewer's yeast, so it's a yeast that could be used to ferment. Although when you buy it in the health food store, I don't know if it's been used in a batch or not yet. <laughs> or could be. Yeah. That's right. Just use it. It is healthy though. Do you guys like uh, you know wheat beers unfiltered usually? Mm -hmm. Brewer's yeast is high in vitamin B, mm -hmm. so I'd much rather buy it in my beer than buy it in the health food store. But <laughs> 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 just saying. Exactly. <laughs> so like I said, we use it for about 13 brews. We cut the cord at that 14th batch for a couple reasons. Uh, if we did want to keep using that colony of yeast, we could. It would still ferment, but the problems you run into pose threats that we don't want to deal with, more or less. So with dealing with multiple generations, you deal with 13 generations, you're going to deal with some mutation. Mm -hmm. So you're not having the same yeast strain that you originally had. And the threat that that poses is actually yeast infection. So a brewery itself can get a yeast infection. <laughs> yeah. Whoa. And it's not fun. It is like. <laughs> Talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> so, uh, in a brewery, a yeast infection is like a zombie outbreak. Like, think of it like that. It yeah. gets everywhere. Instead, it's, it's bad news. We have to get rid of all of our yeast, pressure wash everything, clean it all out, because one little bad bit of yeast can ruin everything. So we don't want to risk that, so we get rid of that uh, you know, 14th generation. And also, yeast always gives off its own... Why not stop at 12? 13 is a lucky number. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's Very lucky, lucky number. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeast also always gives off its own unique flavor. Uh, if you guys have any friends that homebrew and they'll give you a, one of their early batches and you take a sip of it and you do one of these, you're like, Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> and you taste that flavor that you can't quite put your finger on, but it's not pleasant. That's usually yeast. <laughs> it's, it's got almost like a sulfuric flavor. And the only way to get rid of it is with time. But the older that colony is, the more prominent that flavor will become. And it's not pleasant. You don't want it. So that's the other reason that we cut that cord. Once we've saved some of our yeast, we've got our yeast out, the next step is to condition the beer. So we condition it for a couple reasons. A, to get that yeasty flavor out of there. So with time, it will dissipate. And uh, B, to get the alcohol to kind of mellow out, take a back seat, and allow the flavors of the hops and the malts to come forward the way that we want them to much like you would age any spirits, a whiskey or a rum or anything like that. 
you want that alcohol to mellow out, you want all those flavors that you really want the beer to have to come it's forward. It's a shorter timeline though for beers. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, very much, very much so. It doesn't have the uh, beer doesn't have the alcohol content to really remain stable for aging it over long periods of time. Like a, a spirit is forty percent. It's it ages well, but beer, you know, around five or six percent. You don't want to age it for very long. Our uh, we'll age our lagers for about four weeks after fermentation. Our ales for about three weeks after fermentation. Uh, Herminators we age for three and a half months. That guy's actually cool because we age it for three and a half months and we age it at uh, freezing temperatures. So what it does is it freezes the water off, concentrates the alcohol, and concentrates the beer. So what you're left with is a nine and a half percent thick, heavy lager that's aged long enough that it tastes like it's about six percent. And you buy a six pack of it, you don't look at the alcohol content. <laughs> you sit down, you drink two of them, <laughs> you stand up and you do like why do I feel like this? <laughs> you drank four beers in the time you normally drink two beers, and at the brewery we call that getting herminated. <laughs> You've all done it. I have my stories. <laughs> But it's a good beer. It's, it's cool. A good beer. It's a great. Now, I'm gonna pour it for you guys. It's gonna be the last beer I pour for you. All right. Just yeah. <laughs> 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 going, going back, you talked about using the 13 to 30 strains, like or over again, or yeah, using it over again. So certain breweries will do that. So is there are there issues in the brewery world around that in terms of the quality that you're you're giving out to the consumer? So you know, like at some point, is there is there an issue with that and of quality control. Well, that's that's the main issue that we have. Like it, it, that infection with the brewery does affect our quality. Mm -hmm. If we have to clean everything out, we're you know we're dumping batches. We've got to start from scratch pretty much. And it's it really when it comes to quality control, the biggest thing is that flavor. Okay. You don't want your beer to taste funny, right? You, uh, if you uh, your beer can get infected during the fermentation process, mm -hmm. and I've tasted infected home brews and they are disgusting. They taste so bad. So quality control is a huge reason that <laughs> we get rid of that older colony. So I guess what kind of what I'm asking is like, does that sort of distinguish a, a, a top of the line brewery versus one that maybe you know in the industry is kind of like oh, it's, okay. if one's using like 30 times? Is that does that sort of constitute a less you know what I mean? Like yeah, standard less quality. And, and I guess the Pens? consumer even know that. Exactly, that's the thing. But they would know from taste, maybe. And that's where the brewery makes that decision mm -hmm. of how long they want to run that brewery. Uh, we uh, like, we have a full-time microbiologist here, mm. and he does he maintains our yeast colonies. He makes sure that everything's clean, everything's working properly. Uh, every Friday morning, he does taste panel. So he literally tastes beers from the most recent batch <laughs> to five months ago every Friday morning <laughs> and uh, test them for his own personal flavor reference uh, and to the, the general consumer you're not going to notice a huge difference but you will eventually and it's it's kind of uh, like it's not quite a trade secret but it's not something that you just talk about it's like oh these guys obviously use it 30 times it's disgusting uh, it, it's more the end product, right? It's it's how that's judged. So we don't really judge the brewery on how many times they use their yeast. Mm -hmm. We'll judge them on how well they use their yeast, I suppose. Does that kind of answer it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Can you sometimes um, tell the difference between your own batches? Like I personally can't, no. but I don't do paste, paste panel. Yeah. They don't let me. <laughs> I heard a rumor uh, that uh, Labatt's and the bigger companies can turn out a batch of beer in two days in the summer. <laughs> I uh, tastes like it too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, so I've heard. Do you want to buy that? <laughs> well, I know a guy who used to work for Labatt's, and at nine days is wow. what I've heard. So, and that's a lager. So like I said, lagers take longer. Fully finished from brew to bottle in nine days. And I personally don't know what they do to it. All I know is that we do it naturally. <laughs> Some said. Chemical beer. Uh, yeah. 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 Chemical maturation. Are these vats pressurized? Um, or do you let the carbon dioxide bleed off and then they are pressurized, but if it hits a certain uh, like PSI, then right. there are valves that will let the pressure release. And is that how you carbonate your beer, or do you 
add carbon dioxide later? Uh, we add a little bit later. Right. Uh, like uh, in a home brew, you usually put priming sugar in, it's called, and that mm -hmm. carbonates the beer in the bottle. Uh, we do it in our bright beer room, so that's where you can monitor it. And your beer is naturally carbonated, mm -hmm. right? Yes. So, uh, kind of what I was going to talk about next, anyways. Um, once we're done conditioning, the beer in these tanks is the best beer going. Not necessarily our tank specifically, but any brewery that's worth their salt, the beer right off the fermentation tanks is the best. There are taps at the bottom of all these tanks. <laughs> you go in there and you can pour yourself a pint. Not allowed to, <laughs> but you can. Uh, and I'll testify that it's definitely got a level of carbonation straight off the tank. You don't need to add a whole lot. It's that yeast. Yeast is amazing. Mm -hmm. It does so many cool natural things. And it, people didn't even know what yeast to be. The yeast thing was the gods. <laughs> like they, they'd put bread in water and leave it out. And it would start fermentation because there's yeast everywhere. There's yeast all around us right now. And it would just wildly ferment, finish the batch, do it again. The yeast that's left on the inside of the vat would start the fermentation process over. Sourdough. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. It's pretty cool. So what's the main difference between a really hoppy tasting beer and a, a not hoppy beer in the sense of is it actually a mound of hops going in? Yeah, yeah. it's, um, I mean, nowadays we can analyze everything with, to do with all of our ingredients. Um, like when I heard that you guys were agrologists, I went straight to Google. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I had that, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit. <laughs> Trying to search everything that I could. <laughs> and you can, I mean, you can break down everything and the hoppiness of a beer comes down to a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. Like A, how much hops you use. Uh, like I said, the acid in the hops is what gives it the bitterness. How fresh it is. How fresh so it is. So the, like, the cooking time of the hops. Cooking time of the hops yeah. and the acid amount. Okay. So there are certain hop strains that have very high alpha acids. Yeah. And we'll use those early in the boil specifically just for bittering. So it comes down to how long you cook, how much you put in, and what type of hop you're using because mm -hmm. they all have different uh, acid contents. Hmm. Our general manager has a really great poster in his office that actually breaks down all of the hop strains into the acid content that they have and uh, the different essential oils that they have. You pretty much read that and know what your hop will taste like before you even use it in a beer. It's really interesting. So all the hops have to be analyzed before you, you actually buy them or bring them here? They are analyzed, but it's um, that's more of like, it's not, you know, so much batch specific as strain specific, so they're analyzed once they find this new strain of hops and then that acid Wouldn't it depend though on, on the what the growing season was like? And it would. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how much it would depend, but like the, you say that poster and what have you, those are the general guidelines like that. It'll go maybe a little bit in one direction or a little bit in the other direction depending on the year, but it's kind of that general idea of what the hop will be like. And Consistently, yeah. 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 Maybe I missed it, but did you mention where you source your hops? Is there enough local supply? There is no commercial hop farming in mm. British Columbia. Oh. Yeah, what happened to the hops industry? Because it was quite large in the Fraser Valley back in the 80s. <laughs> Diseases? Yeah, it's because we have such a uh, like a very muggy, moist climate. Hops are, you use the hop cone, and it's very hard to maintain. Uh, like mold will grow on your crops and what have you. Uh, so I guess the hop industry fizzled off. I wasn't around to to see it when it was actually around, which sucks because I wish that there was hops in BC. You can make or grow good hops in British Columbia, but they're very hard to maintain. So I guess nobody's been willing to put the effort back <laughs> into having a. This is a multi-year. It is. We have a we have three little hop plants actually growing outside just for aesthetics because they look cool. And there are lots of home brewers that will grow their own hops here. Uh, I know Salt Spring Island grows their own hops on their estate, but for the most part, the hops are sourced from the Yakima Valley. That's where they have, they grow the best hops. And that's where we get our hops. that was the brewery. Quarter to 12, by the way. Oh. Oh. Yeah, there is. Sounds too much fun. And this is, this is always where the... Yeah. Like the bottleneck of the tour. <coughs> Where we just start talking about random different things and recapping and everything. Stressful. Uh, but yeah, let's move on. All right. So, like I said, 
there are taps at the bottom of these. We could pour beers out of them. Do <laughs> it. <laughs> but that's no way to run a business. Uh, I had a guy on a tour one time who said that, yeah, running a business at the bottom of your fermentation tanks is like running a dairy farm at the udders of the cow. <laughs> it just doesn't work very well. <laughs> so, just like milk, we have to bottle our beer. And the first step to bottling is filtration. Uh, it's not the most exciting process in the world. So, right? We do it for a couple reasons. Mainly because we don't pasteurize. So a lot of the big breweries will pasteurize their beer to keep it fresher or longer. But pasteurization is heating something up to the point that everything inside it dies. And we like to think that that negatively affects the flavor. So to avoid pasteurization, and still keep our beer as fresh as we can for as long as we can, we filter it out. You remove all the variables in your beer, you know that every batch produces the same, and you know exactly how long that batch is gonna stay fresh for, which is about five months. If you guys you know, see a six pack, all of our cases are labeled with the packaged on date. If you guys see a six pack older than uh, five months, you guys aren't buying our beer fast enough. <laughs> And look for something fresher, because it'll probably taste better. But over time, certain compounds will break down, new compounds will form in your beer, and the flavors will change. And like I said, because the alcohol content isn't very high in beer, that flavor change is usually negative as opposed to positive. Permanator, you can actually age. Mm. One time, uh, like my favorite example, we sent our beers to the World Beer Championships quite a bit. And one year, we sent a one-year-old Permanator and it won a gold medal. Oh. Next year we signed a fresh one and won a silver medal. <laughs> <laughs> Which is kind of funny. Yeah. But yeah, that one you can age. Once you get into those wine alcohol percentages, you know, 9, 10, 11, 12, but usually you don't want to drink. Beer is best fresh. Fresh is best. And we filter it to keep it fresh for longer than you guys. Uh, once we're done filtering it, it goes to the Bright Beer Room. And a lot of people ask why it's called the Bright Beer Room. That's just another name for fresh beer, uh, green beer, new beer, it's bright beer. And that's where we will monitor the carbonation, add carbonation if need be. And then that's where we send the beer to the bottom line. And that happens through here in the warehouse. Looks bright in there. <laughs> Light's wrong. <laughs> because it is definitely the easiest to see and in my opinion it is definitely the most impressive. So it starts with empty bottles. It's hard to see because there's a whole bunch of solo cups there. But you guys can see a whole bunch of pallets if you lean to the left or if you guys can see them right away of other breweries bottles. So that's because in Canada we have a public bottle pool. The majority of the breweries in Canada will be a part of this bottle pool. And what that means is we all use the same bottle, same size, same shape, uh, same color. Does anybody know why color is important to beer? It's light. UV rays. So it, uh, it'll break down the acids from the hops and it will make your beer stunky. So uh, I'll pick on some big guys because they're big enough that I can pick on them. It won't hurt them. Uh, corona. Yes. If you ever drink a Corona without a lime in it, you'll notice it's a very skunky beer. They mark it the lime because it covers up the skunk flavor. <laughs> <laughs> Hands down, the best, best example is Heineken. Because if you drink a Heineken from a bottle beside a Heineken from a can, side by side, they're two different beers. Totally different beers. Uh, like a lot of people, a lot of diehard Heineken fans will only drink Heineken from a trap on tap. That's because from the bottle, the green bottle, let's light it, and you get a stunky beer. So we use brown bottles to avoid that skunk flavor. And the way it works, you guys buy your six pack, you drink your six pack, you bring it to the recycling depot, they redistribute it to us, and we reuse the bottle. Each bottle will be used about 10 to 15 times, as long as you guys don't you know, break them or we don't break them. Uh, interesting fact, my sister is a, uh, she's a hippie type. 
very, very, very environmentally conscious and engaged and everything. And she always tells me all these facts, which is great. I like to learn them. And she was saying that in the States, where they don't have uh, anything like this in place, enough glass balls are thrown out every month to fill the Sears Tower eight times over. Which is insane. So this is kind of our way of cutting that number down. Once we get the bottles, we line them up on that conveyor belt there. And because those bottles tend to be pretty disgusting when we get them, we put them into that gigantic bottle washer. <laughs> so that big box is a dishwasher, essentially. And it will sanitize the bottles, disinfect the bottles, uh, clean them, make them as clean as you know, take the labels off so you don't peel off our label and find a opening label underneath <laughs> changing gear or something. And yeah, it just makes them as clean as new. Once they're done being clean, they pop up by that white screen there. And this is where I sit on Tuesdays. And I turn that screen on, it lights up, and I watch empty bottles go by for eight hours. <laughs> <laughs> and I check them for cracks or chips. Make sure that you guys get good bottles. It is the most boring job in the world. I, uh, since I started doing that, I've learned how to work the bottle washer so that you know I sit in inspection, get tired, tag the guy out and do the bottle washer for a while. I keep going back and forth, but uh, I cut my finger recently. I had to get a couple stitches, and I couldn't do the bottle washer. So on Tuesday, I had to sit there and watch bottles go by for eight hours, and it sucks. <laughs> and you doze off. <laughs> it's like counting sheep. It's just it's completely mesmerizing. So for that one or two bottles I miss when I do this, we have a second scanner. So we have an electronic bottle inspector called an EBI. And what that guy does is it shoots the light through the bottle and does a computerized scan to make sure that there is definitely no cracks or chips in the bottle. There's no bottle caps. You guys leave your bottle caps in the bottle. You can't reuse them. Uh, if you put your labels, I had a girl really embarrassingly actually asked me on the tour, I'm a label peeler. If I put my labels in my empty bottles, can you reuse those? That's fine. They pretty much disintegrate. But bottle caps, so, save them, make a cork board or something. Out of them. <laughs> Table. Uh, and once it's done the computerized scan, we know that we've got good safe bottles for you guys, and it goes to the filler. So when the bottle goes to the filler, we purge it with CO2 to get all the oxygen out, because oxygen kills the freshness of beer. You know, you leave a glass of beer out overnight, it goes completely flat and stale. Same thing will happen in the bottle if we don't get as much oxygen out as possible. Once we purge it, we fill it with beer, and then after that, we actually shoot a couple drops of hot water at the top of the bottle. And what that does is cleanse the beer of foam and create its own carbon dioxide barrier. So it guarantees that we have as little oxygen in there as possible. Once that barrier is there, we cap it, go through the labeler, and then pop on that far conveyor belt with the uh, Coors 2 floor on. That is where two of our employees stand and hand pack the bottles into six packs at a very fast pace. They are good at it. Once those six packs are packed, somebody puts those six packs onto a flat, somebody then takes the flat, puts it onto a pallet, somebody then takes the pallet and puts the board lift and stacks it in the back there uh, where the truckers will come in the morning, they'll pick up the beer, they'll take it to the liquor stores or the pubs, and you guys will hopefully buy it and hopefully enjoy it. And that is more or less the life of our beer from raw ingredients to finished product. Uh, the canning happens in that white room over there, that brick room, so it's kind of hard to explain. Uh, but it goes through the same process. The only cool thing about canning, I think, is the way a can looks before it's built. That's kind of one of life's great mysteries for people who haven't been around it. And it's just an aluminum cup. So the lid is like a whole meal deal that gets crimped around. It's not somebody with a tiny little welder welding that little hole shot up in the middle of the beer. <laughs> so that's kind of interesting. Uh, and we fill the tags here. So that little dishwasher washes the outside of the tags, and then those five stars very intensively clean the inside and then purge and fill. 
And those kegs get stored in the cold storage room because it takes forever to properly cool a keg and we want to make sure our kegs are always cold. That way if you guys come in here during the week or any time of day and you're not half time, we can sell you a keg. <laughs> uh, any questions? How do you track how many times the bottle has been used? There's uh, no uh, definite indication. But if you guys buy a six pack, and you'll notice sometimes that there's like a white ring around the top and the bottom of the bottle, that's wear and tear. So the bottle is specifically designed for those two points to be the widest point of the bottle, basically to protect the label. So that's where they hit each other on the conveyor belt, and that wear and tear is the best indication of how old the bottle is. You guys want more beer? <laughs> Yes, can have more questions, but questions are always best to ask.